the feeling of making things with your own hands is very hard to replicate. There are so many lessons to be learned about using something that you made with your own hands to make beautiful heirloom items that are gonna last longer than we'll stay alive. I'm Anne, I am a woodworker, a farmer, and a general tinkerer of all things. Let's talk about safety. It's always a good idea to have some first aid on hand just in case, but hopefully you won't need it. This is probably one of the sharpest knives that you've ever held in your hand. I don't say that to scare you. A sharp tool is actually way safer than a dull tool because when a tool is dull, you have to exert a ton of force to make it work the way that it should. And when you're exerting a ton of force, things stop being as predictable as they should be. One really important thing to remember as you are using any tool is to think about the full path of the tool. If you're pushing on it or pulling on it a certain way, what would happen if your wood were to disappear? Think about where your fingers are, where your arms, where the rest of your soft bits are as far as that path goes, and also what's there to stop the blade from continuing to go right into your skin. So when it comes to using a knife, for example, in one of our cuts, we're going to be pulling the knife towards ourselves. but we have a handy dandy stop because we have our elbow tucked in. So the knife can't keep pulling back towards our soft bits because it's sliding up against our body. And so there it is, it's gotta stop. We also wanna think about what would happen if the knife were to slip. So let's take that same cut, for example. As I'm pulling the knife towards me, if the knife does slip, all of my fingers are protected because I'm using the piece of wood to always be between the knife and my soft bits. What would happen if the wood suddenly disappeared? Because sometimes wood splits or, or, or acts differently than we think that it should. So in this same cut, we are going to think about the wood disappearing. So we are cutting right here at the hilt of the knife so that if that wood disappears, that knife can't slip down into these soft bits down here. Another thing that we can think about that's gonna help keep us safe is that our tool holding hand needs to act like a machine. This needs to learn how to do these cuts and these motions repetitively and predictably enough that we know the full path of the tool so that we can protect ourselves. We also want to move it predictably and then we are going to use our work holding hand to produce the wood to the cutting surface, not the other way around. That's also gonna help keep us safe because we know exactly what this knife is doing and we're using our other hand to move the piece of wood around as it needs to be moved. That becomes a lot more obvious when we're doing something like with an ax. If we're moving our ax very predictably like this, then we can see the full path of the ax. So if our wood that we were chopping were to disappear, then we are still safe because the full path has the ax going past our body. So our body is always out of the way. Our soft bits are always out of the way of the path of the tool, regardless of what tool we're using. Now it's actually time to use our knives. And in so doing, we are going to learn two things. First, how to keep ourselves safe always, because as we talked about, this is a very, very sharp knife, but we are also going to learn how to be efficient with a knife. We wanna learn the tools that we need to be able to remove lots of material, to be able to remove material very intentionally, and then of course, to refine our design as we shape our spoon. So let's do that. The first two cuts that we're gonna start with are going to be our most powerful cut. There is a lot of force being directed towards the cutting edge of the knife, and we wanna make sure that we are safe in doing that. And the reason that we start with these two cuts is because with these two cuts, the blade goes out into the ether. It is not towards our body or towards anything important. And, you know, it's a good, it's good to start with knife cuts like that that are going to actually give us room to practice and build our confidence, but not cut anything important. 
First of all, this is the handle of the knife, and you might notice that it's shaped a little bit differently than your pocket knife handle or, you know, a kitchen knife handle. That is because it's designed to fit in your hand, kind of just like this. If you were to imagine the way that you might turn a key in an ignition of a car, that's a little bit how we're gonna hold the knife for a lot of these things. If you like to think about the knife being a pivot point, we wanna use our thumb and our forefinger as those pivot points. And then these ones here just kind of go comfortably around the rest of the knife. As we're going through these cuts, it's gonna be really helpful for you to be asking yourself lots of questions and to do some self-evaluation that's going to help you to replicate the movements that our bodies are making. So we have some, some checklists for all of our cuts that we'll go through. And we're gonna start with what's called the power cut. So this cut has a few little aspects to it, but with all of our cuts, we are going to have a reset point. And with this cut, the reset point is, if you'll imagine with me for a second, what it feels like to lean on a cane. So if you were to actually just stand up and lean on your chair, you might make a few observations about what your body is doing. And in so doing, you'll see that your arm is straight. You'll see that your body is out of the way so that you can be putting gravity where it needs to go. Your wrist is locked in one position. And then the only thing that could probably move in this is if you were to relax your shoulder. So this little shrug motion is the only movement that comes from this cut. Note that if I'm balancing my body, uh, if I were to relax my elbow or move my elbow, I suddenly don't have nearly the balance that I had before. So that's our reset point. If you're having problems with this cut, I want you to literally stand up and lean on your chair and feel what it feels like to lean and then come back and apply the other bits of information we're about to give you. So with this one, we are holding the knife kind of like this. We've got the knife tip is facing towards the inside of our body. The bevel or the sharp point of the edge is facing away from our body so that then when we come out here and lean out over where we can shrug with a straight arm, the knife is kind of just parallel almost with the legs of my chair. If you're having problems with this, um, you may be leaning back. We don't wanna do that. It's often really helpful to move your foot forward so that you can have a little bit more leverage there. And then before you make a cut, I want you to just practice shrugging your shoulder. Feel what it feels like to have a straight arm, a locked elbow. And then the last thing I want you to do is to make sure that the knife tip is pointing up towards the ceiling. A friend of mine always says that when you're holding a tool, you should pretend that the tool handle is a baby bird. You wanna hold it tight enough that the baby bird doesn't get away, but you also want to not crush the baby bird. And that's a really helpful thing to think about here because when we're exerting a lot of force, it's really tempting to want to squeeze really, really hard, but that's going to introduce a lot of um, tension and joint pain and probably error as well. So be careful to keep a nice loose grip on that knife um, with your thumb and your forefinger as that pivot point. And then the next thing that we're gonna think about is that we're always cutting corners. And I'll tell you, I'll be the first teacher that's gonna tell you your success in spoon carving is going to be always cutting corners. We have a little mantra when we're carving spoons. We cut the corner, the corner, and then the middle. It helps us to make a three-dimensional design that matches on both sides, but it also makes it a whole lot easier to cut because if you wanna try it, just go ahead and cut the whole front face of your piece of wood. You might notice that it doesn't work super well. That's a lot of wood to remove at once. But if you just turn it on its corner, you can suddenly remove a whole lot of material. So now we go back to our shrugging motion and we've got a straight arm. Our knife tip is pointed up towards the ceiling. We've got a nice loose grip holding it mostly with our thumb and our forefinger there. We've got our foot forward so that we can lean properly. And then what we wanna do is we wanna take our work holding hand and put the wood up against our body wherever that knife is moving. I talked earlier in the safety portion about making our body like a machine so that we have predictable movements 
and that our knife hand is moving in a predictable and the same way every single time. And the only thing that really moves or changes is the wood that we're putting up to it. So I've got the wood securely up against my, my thigh there, and then I'm gonna start taking some cuts. And as you start to cut, you might notice that, oh, well, it's really hard to cut. And there we get to practice a little bit of motorcycle driving. I like to think about the way that we open and close the throttle of a motorcycle is the same way that we open and close the depth of our cut. So if we you know, throttle way up, we're gonna be making a really, really deep cut. But if we throttle way back, we're gonna make a shallower cut. And so if you get to a point where your nephew is stuck and it just won't go any further, that's a good chance to come just above where you were cutting and try to rotate your knife out a little bit and take a little bit smaller cut. And then remember our mantra, corner, corner, middle. Corner, corner, middle. And you'll find that you can quickly waste a whole bunch of your little pine scrap that you're using here in a hurry. But we also wanna remember that little piece of advice I gave at the beginning about keeping a three-dimensional design going equally. So when we have started to make some cuts on one side, we wanna flip the piece around we wanna reset our position here, check and ask ourselves all the questions. Is my wrist locked? Is my elbow straight? Is my knife tip pointed up? Do, am I uh, you know, positioned so that I can shrug here? I'll tell you, a lot of my students in classes wanna just go like this because it's comfortable. And I mean, our, our eyes wanna see the knife making some cuts, but really we want to make sure that we let gravity do its job here. We have so much more strength to offer when we're using leverage to our advantage, when really here, all we're doing is, is leaning. We're shrugging our shoulder and we're leaning down. And in so doing, we have a ton of power that we can offer because this hand is resisting the cut and this hand is making the cut. So it doesn't actually matter if I'm really, really physically strong or not, if I'm able to use leverage to my advantage. And you see, you can quite quickly make a large block of wood smaller. And Josh has made a beautiful little vampire stake. So congratulations on that achievement. And keep us safe. Another little thing to just mention here is how much of the wood we're actually cutting. And that is an important thing here because if we're gonna try to cut, you know, 10 inches of material at a time, then obviously we're gonna be tempted to, you know, move our elbow or bend our elbow but the path of this cut is really whatever happens when you're shrugging your shoulder. So for me, that's about five inches. And I also wanna be really careful during this that um, my work holding hand, I'm always paying attention to where those fingers are. We always try to make sure that we're cutting below, like well below, maybe two inches below where our fingers would be so that we don't accidentally reset up too high and then you know cut ourselves on accident. Another really important thing to think about here is that we keep this knife tip pointed towards the ceiling because that's what's actually gonna keep us safe with this cut. If we were to point down and then put a ton of force against the knife, if the knife were to catch in the wood, what would happen is our loose grip would force the handle into our hand and then put our fingers in a lot of danger of getting sliced right open by that blade. So keeping the knife tip up helps keep our fingers safe, but it also presents another really important opportunity. And that is that just having that knife tip up allows the knife to naturally make a slicing motion through the wood fibers. And not only does that make it easier to cut through the fibers, it also makes a cleaner cut. So with all of these things, we're talking about safety and efficiency. So now we're going to move on to the chest lever grip. And Josh and I are gonna show you that really quick. This is also known as the chicken dance cut or the way that you make yourself look as ridiculous as possible while carving a spoon. And let's just talk a little bit about the body mechanics that happen here. Just like we had that reset point with our power cut where we, if things aren't going right, we kind of stop and uh, lean on the chair and, and 
think about what's happening with our body weight and our elbow and all that stuff, our reset point for this cut is going to be that our fists never ever leave our body. We are going to be very careful that the motion from this cut comes from our elbows and nowhere else. This is why it looks like I'm doing the chicken dance during this cut. We also have a couple other questions we're gonna ask ourselves when we run into trouble is, can we see all 10 of our fingernails when we look down? Is our arm straight here? Are our palms up? The way that we hold the knife for this cut is a little bit different than we do for the power cut. We want to have our palm up and we want to lay the knife down in it with the bevel or the cutting edge facing towards our body and the knife tip on the outside of our body. So that then when we close our hand around the knife, it looks a little something like this. Then we are going to open our hand again and turn using our elbow, our arm around so that our fingertips are pointing directly at our chest. And then we are going to close our hand around it and bring the knife up to our chest. As we close our hand around the knife, the only part of our knuckles that is going to touch our chest is this part of our knuckles right here. So as we use our elbow to rotate our hand around, we look down and we confirm, yes, we can see all five of those fingers. Then we start with the knuckle of our pointer finger touching our chest first. And then we can just practice using our elbow to rotate slowly so that then the knuckle of our middle finger, then our ring finger, then our pinky finger touches. And as we do that, this is the full range of motion for this cut. Then we're going to grab our workpiece and we're gonna grab our workpiece the exact same way we did our knife. We're gonna have our palm up. It's going to be having about four inches facing out past the outside of our body there. And then as we rotate it around with our palm up, we are going to bring our pointer finger to touch our chest. And then the action of the cut, if we're to do it in slow motion, first has us like with a very awkward collapsed chest situation here. But as we rotate our elbows with our wrists locked, we are rotating the knuckles of our hands on the chest and that's creating basically a giant pair of scissors. This is allowing us to use our body to create an enormous amount of leverage. So the strength from this cut does not come from actual muscles. It comes from us being able to use our body as a lever. So if you were to ma imagine maybe breaking a stick for a bonfire up against your chest, which I know this is probably not something people do, but what you would do is you would, you would take it and you would use your chest as leverage to be able to snap that stick. And that's exactly what's happening with this cut. We are using our chest as leverage. And it is so important that the motion comes from our elbows and not from us, you know, moving our wrist or, or going like this because we're gonna lose control, which makes us unsafe, but it also makes the cuts that we're making a whole lot less predictable as well. So as you're practicing this cut, I want you to be asking yourself a whole bunch of questions. I want you to ask yourself, if I look down, can I see all 10 of my fingernails? When I'm making this cut, is the motion coming from my elbows? When I'm making this cut, am I moving my wrist at all? Because it makes it a whole lot easier to make this cut if we're making, moving our wrist, but then it introduces a ton of strain into our wrist, which is gonna cause a lot of problems down the road. And it also is not nearly as powerful of a cut. With this cut, I'm also gonna ask you to remember the things that we learned with the power cut. Are we doing our little mantra, corner, corner, middle? And you'll notice that this hand does, you know, move a little bit. It does rotate and change, but that's because if we are 
using our body as a machine, if we're making this motion repetitive, and if we're actually doing this correctly, we are only wanting to produce the wood to the cut, and we're never moving the cut to meet the wood, which keeps us safe and makes this really, really predictable. The other thing too, is that when we introduce this second movement with our other hand, and we actually start using this like a pair of giant scissors, we end up actually getting twice the force because we are now not just cutting the wood, which we can do like this. We are also creating more leverage by using the wood to resist the cut. So that is, like I said, a great way to look ridiculous, but it's also a great way to remove a ton of material in a very controlled way in a hurry. So a good way of throwing shavings at your friends. True. Well, I'd have to use my other hand for that, but. Right, you can get really good at it. We can actually practice this motion and practice this motion, and the minute we grab the knife, we just forget everything that we just learned and just like, yes, let's make some shavings. But really, if you're really having a hard time with this, a great thing to practice is to actually put your knife down and grab two pieces of wood instead, and then go through the things, palm up. The point is out that way, the point is out that way. We're gonna try to do this without dropping them. We're gonna close our hands around it. We're gonna look to make sure that we see all 10 fingers. We're gonna ensure that this is a straight line and that it's not like curved or curled weird that's gonna you know, make it harder. And then we're gonna you know, think about getting punched in the chest and how weird it, feel, it would feel if we did that. And so then our body's gonna curl forward like this. And then we're gonna take a deep breath and go. And in so doing, keeping our fingers on our chest, they're able to rotate the way that they should. And we are able to practice this motion without the stress or excitement or whatever it is that, that has the knife, you know, doing what it's not supposed to do the minute we put it in our hand. You're gonna see Josh and I doing these cuts and it's gonna look, you know, easy. And it, we're gonna be doing it in a hurry and removing a ton of material in a hurry. But if you are trying it for the first time, slow it down. Try to do it in slow motion so that you can really observe every single motion. And that's why I talk about having our, our knuckles on our chest and then just feeling what it feels like to have this knuckle, then this knuckle, then this knuckle, then this knuckle. Just make that rotation with our elbow. If we're able to move slow enough, if we're able to, to get rid of our desire to just make shavings and slow down, then we can really learn how to do it right, which is um, how we then become fast because the more we can ingrain these motions and make them automatic responses when we're in this position, the less our brain has to think about, and that then allows us to do this really quickly and efficiently. In the military, they have a saying, slow is smooth, smooth is fast, and this is what this means. When you start out, you need to go slow, and you should be able to do this cut moving slowly. I can pay attention to how thick the shaving is, or where the knife is, or if it's about to come out. And as I continue to do this, and I continue to practice and make those observations, then this becomes smooth or steady. And then your brain goes, this is exactly how it needs to go. So that eventually, without really thought or conscious thought, you can make this movement and you're safe and you can move through it very quickly. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to like and subscribe to stay up to date on all of our latest videos.